sorry, I'm not trying to be a Grinch or anything. Of course, like, have your Christmas, have your tradition. Just don't murder anyone in the process. Like, it's just completely contradictory. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Carb Strong Cast. This Carb Strong Cast episode, I thought I'd make it a little bit special, do a little Christmas special, but I want to dedicate this one to my amazing Patreon st- supporters. Uh, my Patreons have been with me for a couple of years now, and it's the reason why I get so much freedom to spend 100% of my time focusing on you know, animal rights activism and vegan advocacy. Love all my Patreon supporters. So what I did is I messaged them all and I asked them to send in some little questions. And what we're going to do in this podcast is answer uh, questions that my Patreons have. And I'm sure they just apply out to everyone too. So it's going to be an interesting podcast. And thank you all for tuning in. So it's getting towards the end of the year. Um, I I always do a lot of reflection towards the end of the year and, you know, looking how far I've come and... I, I never become complacent. If anything, I have just this itch that just keeps coming more and more pronounced as as the time goes by. So I'm in a bit of a planning phase at the moment. My team has changed. I'm back up by myself. Everything's sort of changed. It's it's starting to, you know, I'm starting to think ahead again. And, you know, I, I'm planning everything from the ground up once again. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through these questions from my patrons and you know we're gonna just go with the flow see how things go so first question is from Stephen York how's it going Stephen um and he says hey Joey what was your most memorable activism experience of 2019 oh mate now there's a couple of memorable experiences of 2019 that the the ones to do with activism would have to be um at the start of the year i did a campaign against a man called pierce morgan who was coming against vegans and they wouldn't get me on the show for another debate so i took it upon myself to go at him in various ways going to farms uh you know found a poor dead bobby calf in a bin at a dairy farm uh, going into piggeries and just showing Piers Morgan that what he's actually defending. Had a campaign called What Are You Defending? Or What Is Pierce Defending? I think it was. Uh, we've got a website still up. But yeah, that was quite memorable. But there was about three and a half weeks which I took off to do something way out of my comfort zone. And it was for TV. Um, I will be releasing the details of what that is actually very soon. I believe maybe this weekend coming I'll be releasing the details to that. So, Stephen, you'll be able to know <laughs> what my most memorable activism experience of 2019 was, and it was way outside of my comfort zone, and I can't wait to share that all with you very soon. Next question is from Jan. Jan Koziec. Sorry if I can't pronounce that properly, but hi, Joey. Thanks for your work. Thank you for your support. I hope you will be able to keep it going, of course. To my question, do you know of any religious group, preferably a Christian one, that also officially promotes veganism and animal rights. Thank you. Well, there are Christian vegans and there are Muslim vegans. Um, and I just don't know of any specific group called the Christian vegans or the... I think I've seen one called Muslim vegans on Facebook. So if you just... I would just Google it up. Google it up, say Muslim vegans or Christian vegans, whichever is your faith. And I'm sure there's a vegan promoting the message and also who adheres to that type of religion. Let's have a look here. Halo. Ooh. You know that Beyonce song? I can see a halo. Okay, no questions, but just wanted to say thank you for all you do, and have a happy vegan Christmas. Of course, we're going to have a happy vegan Christmas. There's nothing weirder to me than celebrating, you know, Jesus Christ by sitting around a sacrificed animal, like an animal that's been butchered and you know, raised in a factory farm and had their head cut off and you're eating their blood and flesh, you know, it's tr- trying to celebrate family and, you know, this the life of Jesus Christ around a dead body. It's more like a satanic ritual to me and I just don't understand it. Sorry, I'm not trying to be a Grinch or anything. Of course, like, have your Christmas, have your tradition. Just don't murder anyone in the process. Like, it's just completely contradictory to what the spirit of Christmas actually represents. Um, I don't know if I'll edit this. Maybe I'll just leave this unedited. We'll see. We'll see how we go. Okay, now we've got Roch. 
R O C H Roche. Maybe that's Roche, right? Rochelle. L Elemer. Or it could be a male. Um, oh, Rock. Pronounced Rock. He's put it at the end of the question. Okay. <clears throat> right on, man. Listen. In advance of the new year, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much, Rock. I consider you as the leader of this ever-growing movement. I wouldn't say that, but I appreciate uh, the admiration that you're showing me, but I wouldn't say I'm a leader of the movement. I would, I would, well, you said that you consider me as the leader. I just wouldn't say that. I'd say I've got leader tendencies, like I, I seem to push myself into the forefront, but I just think we all, we all contribute to this movement um, in many different ways, and by no means am I the leader of the movement. I'd, I'd, I would never suggest that, and I, I just think we're all we're all equal, and we all bring different things to the movement. Rock says, "Very inspiring. Thank you so much, Rock. I appreciate that, and it's, I feel I take that as a compliment. Um, I'm very happy and proud to be one of your patrons. I'm so grateful that you're one of my patrons. Thanks, Rock. My question to you is: Okay, we're getting to the question." <laughs> Do you still maintain relationships with non-vegan friends and non-vegan family members? And if so, do you find that difficult to do? Let me have a little sip oh, of my coffee here. I'm using um, Oatly Barista. But if you can get the Oatly Barista, it's the best um, vegan milk to use with coffee. It's really creamy. It's quite rich though, but it's delicious. Do I still maintain relationships with non-vegan friends and family? <clears throat> I, To be completely honest with everyone and transparent, I am isolate myself quite a lot from a lot of people, not just non-vegans, but everyone. <laughs> I, I spend a lot of t time alone and I only have a very small group of uh, people that I am in communication with. I don't know whether that's because of my past and, you know, like mixing with lots of people. I've had, you know, it, I've had like negative experiences mixing with different crowds and different groups. I like to really keep my circle quite small as I've gotten older. Um, so that's just generally. But in terms of specifically like non-vegan friends, um, to be honest with you, I don't uh, really have much contact with um, people that aren't vegan generally, but I have a lot of respect for my older friends. A lot of them, a lot of them. Uh, we They have been with me through some of my hardest times and they've seen me at, at my low, lowest points. And there is just... A level of respect that I have for those people, whether they're vegan or not, that I just, um, I couldn't wipe my hands of someone who's been there for me in my, through my hardest times. I have a, a level of loyalty to people like from my past that, um, and respect, you know, not everyone obviously, but there's a few people that even though they're not vegan, I still, I still love them dearly and, you know, love them like family. But it doesn't mean that I'm with them constantly. <laughs> um, everyone, as I've grown up, we've all just started to part ways and, and that's what happens. And it's not necessarily to do with, you know, being vegan or not. It's just uh, that, you know, as I've gotten older, I've learned to part ways and I, I'm really focused on my mission. Um, but I can see how that could be difficult, 100%. When it comes to non-vegan family, like I, when I when I was back in Australia, back around my family, if I had a birthday or something, then we'd be eating vegan at my birthday. Otherwise, I would just not have you there. Like if you want to um, order a dead baby lamb on my birthday, then you can just leave or like not, I don't want you celebrating with me if you're going to hack up a baby to do that. Um, that's just, and, and out of out of common respect for a friend who's against the murder of animals, who's against animal abuse and animal cruelty, out of respect for that individual, why wouldn't you just eat vegan on that occasion? Otherwise, you're just showing pure disrespect to that person. You know, it's like it's like if you go into a, to a different country where there's a different culture and there's uh, a way to dress. So like I was in um, Bali recently, and when you go into the temples, you have to wear a sarong. It's, and if you were to be like, no, I don't wear a sarong. I'm just going to go into this temple and disrespect and offend uh, their culture and their and the people that live there. Then I would just think that's a dick move. It's the same with a vegan who's in principle against animal cruelty. And you were there just eating a dead animal who'd been tortured in a slaughterhouse in front of them on their birthday. I just think that that just, it's the height of disrespect. And a true friend, a true family member who really cared about you would put their, you know, 
meat eating habit aside for one day for you. I just think that that's, that's the least they could do. I mean, I would do it. I mean, I, I w- well, obviously I wouldn't go against my principles and start eating meat on someone's birthday, but like but, when it comes to like a, a, an issue of justice, like animal abuse or child abuse, or someone was, let's just say someone was mentally abused, um, then I would avoid certain topics to uh, make sure that they weren't triggered by that. Like say, say someone was suffering PTSD from the war. I'm not going to go in there and start talking about, you know, this war movie that I watched where people are getting their heads blown off in, fr- in front of that pet person. I'll just be like, well, that's got, they've got this PTSD. They're in the war. I'm going to be a little bit sensitive about that. Same with a vegan. If you if they're a vegan because they're against animals being killed, then why eat a murdered animal in front of them? It just doesn't. It just it just shows a level of disrespect uh, to that individual. If if a friend is going to deliberately do that, they're not a friend. They're not a friend of yours. When I, I'll tell you a story of some of my friends, um, you know, from my past too, and really hard, really my mate uh, Chad, real hard guy like he he used to go toe to toe on the street with anyone i I never seen him back down in a fight he was a real tough guy um recently it was only it was only 18 months ago i went to his house um they were all drinking i obviously don't drink and they had a bit of a sort of a catch-up and there was lots of people there they had roast uh pig i think they, they roasted pigs um but what they did when I arrived is they put everything away. They put all the animal animal products away while I was there. And I was there for two hours. And people were hungry and, and all of this. But they, they didn't bring out the animals, that they that the murdered animals, until I'd left. So I just thought that that was an amazing show of respect from some old friends of mine. And I, I truly appreciated that. Um, they're not vegan, right? My mate's not a vegan. He eats killed animals. He eats murdered animals. But... Out of respect for me, he just didn't bring him out to the table. He knows what I do for a living, you know. He knows he knows that I, he knows what I do as a passion. He knows how close this is to my heart, you know. And he and he he just waited till I left. So I thought that was an amazing show of respect. So anyway, um, yeah, that's the answer to the question. I I don't know if I answered your question in detail, but yeah, that's my experience. Now I I I'm a bit of a bad um, example of someone just who maintains relationships with old friends because I've, I've kind of, I'm in a different country now. I'm a traveling activist. I, I generally have a small circle anyway. And, you know, people know my principles and I have a different type of character than to someone who's, who my character is very strong. So when I'm in the room and, you know, you know about it, <laughs> you know about it. So if there's a murdered animal you know, and I'm around, then you'll know about it. Um, so people just respect that. And like my character is different to other people. So I have a, a video on my channel called uh, How to Deal with Non-Vegan Family and Friends. I think that might help you with, because uh, everyone's personality type is slightly different. Well, a lot different, not slightly different. I mean, you could be a young 12-year-old you know, or thirteen-year-old teenage girl, and you know, you just don't have that strong character. There are there are ways that you can adapt to situations if you don't have that real s- strong character where you you don't want to displease anyone. You know, there's there's ways of adapting and you know navigating these difficult situations. Check out my video. Earthling Ed also has a great video on that as well on his channel. Um, let's have a look here, Natasha Palaria. The longer I am vegan, the more it hurts my heart that most people are not. I am somewhat hopeful about the future of this movement, but at the end of the day, it all feels the same. I am literally existing with a broken heart constantly because the animals are always on my mind and in my heart. I feel very connected to them, like I've never felt before. Everywhere I look, there are new restaurants that include steakhouses and seafood places. I sometimes can't breathe from always feeling overwhelmed. Watching smiling, smacking lips, spending hundreds on food is like living amongst demons. The amount of Money made by raping, torturing, and murdering innocent beings is astronomical. Exactly, it's, it's crazy. How can I cope with these feelings in dealing with non-vegans in everyday life, including being judged and questioned all the time about my moral obligations? Okay, so this is a very serious uh, question. And Natasha says, how do I cope with these feelings? Um, I'm sorry that you're going through that, Natasha, but I just want you to know that you're not the only one who goes through this. Um, we all do. 
this is what I mean. This is what I was talking about before about different characters. Um, Natasha's obviously got a, a very empathic nature where she's feeling things very deeply, which happens to me a lot too. But I've got a bit of a rough, I'm a bit more rough. I've had a bit of a rough life and I've learned to block certain things out um, as a survival sort of mechanism. Natasha's feeling things very deeply. How can I cope with this, she's saying. Dealing with people questioning her and judging her all the, all the time about my moral obligations. Now, Natasha, I want you to look at your perspective here. I mean, obviously, uh, animal eating animals is, you know, very normalized in society. So most people contribute to this abuse that happens to animals. But if it was child abuse, if someone was questioning you about why you don't contribute to the abuse of children, would that be a hard you know, question to answer, would you, you know, you would be very fixed in your belief there, you'd be like, what do you mean, that's ridiculous, of course I'm not going to abuse children, it's completely unnecessary, why would I derive pleasure from the um, abuse of an innocent child, this is the same here, I want you to feel very strong in your conviction here, because the stronger you are in your conviction of why you, do, why you don't do something that's evil, um, you know, the easier it is going to be to cope with these feelings, just... I don't know when the last time you watched Dominion is or like just like, like watching something like Dominion. I mean, as horrible and horrific as it is and as hard as it is, it, it really shifts your perspective from what you're going through right now to what the animals go through on a day to day basis. And it, it really does give you this really strong perspective where like you're just like, oh, my God, like, you know, I'm getting judged. I'm getting I'm getting questioned all the time. But look at this. Look what's happening here, you know. Um, so I, I just want you to re try to shift your perspective and when you're feeling like that and just know that you're not alone, you know. Y you're not alone. We are all feeling very similar at times. Sometimes I have highs, sometimes I have lows. I would ask you to, um, like, do you get involved in any type of activism? Are you, are you vocal? Do you have an outlet? Because having an outlet... Um, having a feeling like you're doing something to make a difference can help you overcome those feelings where like you say everywhere I look at there are new restaurants that include steakhouses and food places I can't breathe from always feeling overwhelmed you know people eating animals all around you and are you doing something um, productive to give you the feeling that you are helping to make a difference I mean obviously you're a patron of mine so that's a way that you're helping to contribute to activism. Is there any other way that you can help make a dent in these industries? And when when you do that, when you're when you're it makes you feel less helpless when you're doing something proactive to help stop the the abuse that happens to animals in whatever way you can. So the more proactive you are, the less helpless you'll feel. The more perspective you have about what's happening to animals, the, the less hard you're going to find it to cope with these feelings that you get by being judged and questioned all the time. So I hope those two things help. Perspective, see what's going on with the animals. You know, think of it in terms of child abuse. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to sit there and justify why you don't abuse children. So you're not going to sit there and try to justify why you don't abuse animals or feel obligated to justify why you don't abuse animals. So the perspective thing and then uh, the proactive um, way you're helping to solve the problem with animals so that you don't feel helpless. I think those two things might help a lot. Now, look, I don't claim to have all the answers either, guys. I'm just giving, like, a bit of advice, if, you know, that, that might help. The things that help me. I mean, there's obviously... There could be better advice out there. I mean, I'm not, not, not claiming to know everything, um, you know. But, yeah, I'm just... We're all trying our best, aren't we? Someone's called the Drama Llama, and it's quite hilarious. There's a little picture of a llama poking their tongue out. Like, really cute. Do you think that items made using animal products but not containing animal products are vegan i.e beer filtered with icing glass icing glass what's icing glass let me just i s i n g l a s let's just look that up a kind of gelatin of chain ah oh, cool i didn't know that thanks drama llama didn't know what icing glass was a kind of gelatin obtained from fish okay um, do I think beer filtered with fish gelatin is vegan? I always hear people say no. But by that same logic, wouldn't sugar filtered with bone char not be vegan either? Or any organic produce because of the livestock manure used? 
I think one could argue that the, the only reason these items are made using animal products is because there's an abundance of cheap leftovers from the meat industries. And if we stop the demand for meat, then these products will just use alternatives. Since animal products are not required to create these foods, do I have any thoughts? Well, Jama Lama, I think we're getting into the as far as practically possible sort of area. Um, let me just have a sip here. Oh my God, Oatly Barista is so good. But, so let's just think about this. Like, obviously, we do eat produce that has been fertilized with manure. And, like, you know, when you start going down the line there and, you know, start, you know, the only reason they're using this manure is because there's so many animals being bred and they don't have anything to do with these tons and tons of feces. So they're throwing it all over our crops. So if we all went vegan, um, they obviously wouldn't have all this feces to throw on the crops. And we'd be thinking about veganic farming and using more towards the um, synthetic um, crop fertilizers. Uh, so what you're saying is veganism solves this problem where like all of these, you know, leftover body parts and, you know, you know, fish gelatin from the fishing industry and, you know, these weird little, you know, just bone char and all this stuff they're using to filter products. They wouldn't be using these products if we all went, went vegan. Um, because they wouldn't have byproduct. They just wouldn't have byproduct, you know, so, yeah, I get that. Now, sugar. Sugar's a very difficult one because it's if you start saying, like, look, if you choose organic sugar, I know they don't filter organic sugar with bone char, and I know beet sugar isn't filtered with bone char, char and if you're in the UK, a lot of the sugar, like I think the majority of the sugar is beet sugar. When you start talking about sugar and then you start talking about processed foods that don't contain animal products but that sugar might be an ingredient and then you, you don't know whether that sugar was processed with bone char, with, was filtered with bone char, you know, uh, was it beet sugar, was it organic sugar, you start getting into this realm of like, okay, now we're getting really far down the line here, you know, um, you might pick up a vegan bar, like a vegan protein bar, and it might have sugar in there, then you, that, you've got to call the company and see what type of sugar they used in this, you know, instance, and whether that sugar was then filtered with bone char, somewhere down the line. <laughs> you Look, know. like, then you start talking about wine, right? Let's talk about wine. If you buy a bolognese sauce, right, that says, okay, in the, in the ingredients, it's tomatoes, garlic, onions, wine, you know? You don't know whether that wine was vegan, you know? Then you, you, go, you, you go call the, the pasta company, find out if their wine was filtered with isinglass, is that if I'm pronouncing that right, with fish gelatin, you know, uh, then you find out that it was, and then you're like, okay, that that bolognese sauce has used animal byproducts. Now, if we were to use this logic, then beer, wine, um, sugar uh, filtered with b bone char, those products are not vegan, but fruits and vegetables that are fertilized with manure are vegan. Drama Lama I think what you're saying is we are contradicting ourselves there. We right. might be contradicting ourselves there. And I, I can see that's a bit of a conundrum there. That's a bit of a moral conundrum. Like sugar filtered with bone char or an apple that's they've used manure to, to fertilize the crops there. Like it's still animal byproducts that have been used in the process. Now this is like, this is kind of going into, this is kind of a gray area. This isn't a black and white uh topic here sort of, it's not as direct as using dairy products it's not as direct as hey you buy cheese they are, you're directly causing the the dairy industry to make money and exist and exploit cows when you buy um an apple you know are you supporting the are you supporting animal agriculture directly by buying that apple if they've used feces on to fertilize that apple it's a it's a very it's a very kind of open question and up for debate here. Um, you know, like me personally, I, I don't drink alcohol, but if I did, I would try to get the vegan wine because uh, there's an alternative. Uh, I, I know there's there's certain beers that don't use uh, fish gelatin, so I, I'd go for those. Um, when it comes to sugar, if you got a if you got a um, choice between beet sugar, which is made from beets, <laughs> and um, you know just cane sugar filtered with bone char, um, then, you know, obviously I'm going to go for the one that's easy to choose, which is the vegan one. I'll ch choose the vegan option. Um, I know organic sugar, which is only like 50p more 
or something like that, really cheap, like hardly anything more, isn't filtered with bone char. So I'll just go for the organic sugar. When it comes to apples and pears and, and berries and things like that, am I going to ring up every single grower? Oh, we, we've imported this from Greece. We've imported these berries from um, France. Th th those apples came from um, someplace in you know, Eastern Europe or, you know, these, these, this wheat was from Australia or this, this rice was from Thailand. Um, am I going to start telling people you got to, you better check where the, where that rice came from and how much manure was used in the, in the process of growing that. That just gets out of the realm of as far as practically possible for me. Um, so for me, when it comes to plant produce with manure being used, you can't trace that. It's really hard to trace that. And yeah, like, and, and if we all went vegan, they wouldn't be using all this manure to fertilize crops. So for, 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 to answer your question simply, with beer, Corona, they don't use uh, fish gelatin. So I would choose that, C Corona. It's a very easy choice to make. So you can avoid that. When it comes to, what else did we say? Sorry, what else? I'm just having a look here. Sugar. Sugar is a really easy, beet sugar. Really easy choice. But when it comes to buying, say, say you, you know, you bought a cake, it's vegan. Um, you know, someone baked a cake and it was a vegan cake, but you don't know what sugar they used. Are you going to avoid the cake? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this is where it gets difficult. Like if I got to, it's not whether I would avoid the cake, it's whether I'm going to tell people to avoid that cake if it's all the, pro if all the products in there are plant-based, Right. Don't use no, no eggs, no dairy, and there might be some sugar in there that you don't know. It's kind of 50-50 whether it was beet sugar, organic sugar, I don't know, maple sugar, or whether it was cane sugar filtered with bone char. It's just like, would I tell people to avoid that? I think you're making things, I think that would be making things very complicated, but you're going to buy a bag of sugar. It's easy to buy the organic bag of sugar and avoid the bone char. It's easy to buy a bag of beet sugar and avoid the bone char or try a different alternative sweetener and avoid sugar, cane sugar altogether. Um, those, so there are things, practical things you can do to avoid the bone char. Um, but in terms of all, in terms of all circumstances, I don't know, that just gets out of practically possible. I think that's just like, whoa. Um, and fruits and vegetables. I don't even know if I really want to go there. I don't even know if it's very wise to go there right now. Um, because that, that that's just a very big that just opens up Pandora's box when you start uh, going into that area. So I hope that uh, sort of answers it. I know that was very, you know, long and drawn out. But hey, if you want to add to the discussion, send us an email or, you know, comment down below if this is on YouTube and we can you can open up the discussion there. Okay, let's go on to the next question. And like I said, like I don't have... I don't have all the answers. I don't claim to know everything. There are obviously some gray areas that, you know, we can discuss the moral implications of. You know, we're, we're all learning as we're going. Um, a lot of these issues are very new. A lot of these issues haven't been talked about, discussed, or even researched in depth yet. So we have to um, really keep an open mind and, and keep the discussion open. Jay Alders. Uh, excuse me, just having a sip of the old coffee there. Hi, Joey. Thanks for what you're doing. Thank you for your support, Jay. I really appreciate it. I have a question. How do I reconcile thoughts on having pets, particularly rescued pets? Not only the aspect of keeping an animal, in quotations, but also for people who perhaps discover veganism after they already have a dog or cat. I went from vegetarian to vegan about eight years ago, and at the time I had a cat. I know dogs can have veggie food, but cats are very difficult, if not impossible, to keep healthy on a vegan diet. Um... I tried, someone in brackets, I tried. He's since passed on, so this isn't an issue. I'm very sorry you lost your cat. Um, I have to deal with, but there's, it's something I still don't know how to wrap my head around. So I guess um, one aspect of the pets thing is the keeping of the animal. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll address that first. Um, the, the, if you're going to rescue a dog or cat, the alternative to you if you were not to rescue them, would be they get euthanized. So I think rescuing them is the most ethical thing to do. Um, it's And you can't just let a cat and dog roam free in society. You just can't do that. They'll just get, especially in the Western world, in Thailand and Bali, yeah, you can have uh, street dogs. It's fine. Um, the best thing we can do is control the breeding of domesticated animals and make sure they don't run around out in the street and get picked up by, you know, a dog catcher and get sent to, to a welfare, you know, shelter and when they get euthanized so that that's a, the most vegan thing we can do is control their breeding so there's not 
millions of them running around and, and millions more of them getting euthanized. I mean, that's the best thing we can do. When it comes to feeding dogs, dogs can be vegan very easily. They can they can have a plant-based diet very easily, nutritionally adequate plant-based diet. They're Border Collie, four year, uh, the fourth oldest um, dog ever was a Border Collie. I mean, I, actually, well, let's just pick, let's just, well, let's just go. Let's just uh, I'm Google it up. Oldest uh, dog vegan, um, Bramble. One remarkable, remarkable, one remarkable example is that Bramble, a 27-year-old border collie whose vegan diet of rice, lentils, and organic vegetables, earned her some consideration by the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's oldest living dog in 2002. So yeah, yeah, dogs are fine. Um, now cats. Now your other question. Um, was about cats. Let's have a look. I went from a veggie. Okay, and I had a cat at the time. Now you said it's nearly impossible to keep a, he a cat healthy on a vegan diet. Now I, don't, I just that is not true. I can objectively say that's not true. Um, there are many anecdotes, hundreds or even thousands of anecdotes of vegans having cats that they feed a plant based diet. That's formulated. So all all they're doing, right? You know how you can make a Beyond Burger where they they get a some a pea like some peas and they turn it into meat. What they're doing with, with cat food is they're isolating the proteins out of the plants. They're adding the um, taurine, um, the nutrient profile that a cat needs, okay? And they're formulating plants into, like, meat for cats. That's it. Cats need taurine. So if, you're, if you monitor these cats... Um, and you feed them a nutritionally adequate plant-based diet. They, there's no reason why they can't be eat, eat a plant-based diet. I mean, there's no reason to stab one species of animals in the throat to feed to a cat. It makes no ethical sense whatsoever. Um, and when you say, um, my friend, that you tried, um, I'm not sure what how how much you tried or whether you had confidence in trying. Um, there, there is a study done on vegetarian. Um, animals, even cats, and, you know, as long as their, I think it's their acid in their urine is monitored, um, you can have perfectly healthy plant-based cats, and there's many anecdotes I know in the movement of people with uh, vegan cats, and it's just like, like, think of a Beyond Burger, how they get that to taste like meat, you can, you can have a fiber, like, I think, you take all the fiber out of the plants, you know, isolate the amino acids, the protein, add in the, the nutrients that cats would get from meat, like a supplement in there. And what you've just basically formulated meat for cats out of plants. I mean, we have technology to do that now. And there's there's veterinary approved vegan cat food out there. Just Google it up. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Jay. Thank you for that question. It's one we get a lot. Jane Peters. Hi, Jane. How do you stop yourself from going nuts after seeing the torture and abuse and murder of animals? Oh my God, yeah, that is hard. And and he, so Jane continues on to say, I've only seen videos and it's pretty much impossible to close my eyes without seeing a little pig being stabbed in the throat or a cow being punched or trying to get to her baby who's being dragged away by his little leg, having no clue what the hell is going on. Oh my God. And then she says, uh, she goes on to say, thank you for everything you do. You're a really good person. We're so lucky to have people in the world like you who are actually getting out there and doing everything they possibly can to end the suffering. Much love and respect, Jane. Thanks, Jane. We all try our best. I mean, I think maybe I could try a little bit harder and just give it more of my all. We'll, we'll see how we go. See how we go next year, actually. The, the, this this year is nearly ending. Um, so whenever she closes her eyes, she can visualize the uh, pigs being stabbed and cows being punched and it's just horrible. So Jane, I totally understand that. Jane sounds like another empath. A lot of vegans are empaths here. Um, so how do I stop myself from going nuts? I do something productive to try to end, to try to, I use what happens to animals as fuel for my activism. It makes me angry and I use that anger and I turn it into being productive and it forces me to to do something about what's going on to them that's what i do um all of those visualizations you're having that's the animals calling out for your help think of it like that those animals are calling out for your help do not feel helpless do something every single day anything sharing a post making a video um getting out there and talking to people in the supermarket if you're a runner 
run long distances and attribute it to the vegan diet. Say you don't have to eat animals to get big and strong if you like doing weights. Um, whatever it is, however, however you're going to advocate, if you like cooking recipes, cook some recipes up for, you, for your friends and you know, teach them about you know, vegan cooking without animal cruelty. What, whatever it is, use, use what's the, these visualizations of what's happening to animals and, and, and use that as fuel to help stop what's happening to them, to help stop the abuse that's happening to them. Um, in whatever way you can, there's multiple different ways of doing that. But yeah, I would say let it fuel you. Don't let it break you. Ryan says, Joey, love your content. Thanks so much, Ryan. You've mentioned in the past that there are forms of vegan activism you don't personally do for various reasons, even though the motivations of the activists you may agree with. Are there any forms of popular activism you would consider consider problematic or ineffective that are detracting from the movement in your view. Okay, just going to have another sip of this Oatly coffee. I'm not <laughs> not actually sponsored by Oatly, but it's delicious. Oh, delicious. Oh, my God. Are there any forms of popular activism I'd consider problematic? <laughs> Ryan, um, the longer I've been an activist, the longer I've been in the movement, I'm starting to think that um, I don't actually know if there's any type of activism if done with the right intention is problematic um, because after talking to that vegan couple on a podcast, they were talking about the radical flank effect, how um, people viewed Malcolm X as militant and extreme. And what that ended up doing was uh, it helped um, Dr. Martin Luther King look less militant. <laughs> so they both had the same intention in a way, but Malcolm X actually provided the radical flank, which helped uh, Martin Luther King look less extreme. So without Malcolm X, um, Martin Luther King looked extreme. So when you talk about in the vegan movement, you got these people in, you know, steakhouses causing this disruption like DXE and that. I think that's very important for the movement. Um, it creates a debate. And then you get someone like Earthling Ed or James Aspie on TV or, you know, Natasha and Luca or... You know, you name them and then they start discussing it with the vegan advocacy. When it, when you force things into a debate with these extreme, in quotations, forms of activism, we come in and we, we win the debate, which is like what Wayne Husung, is it Wayne? I, I really wish I could pronounce his name. But the, the, the founder of DXC says in his speech, I mean, and uh, whether or not I think they're effective, like, that's another thing. Do, what, do you, what do you mean? What do I mean? What do you mean by effective? Like, not everyone is a vegan advocate. Some people are activists. They're just, they're, they're, they're trying to force the, the conversation of animal rights into the into the media. That doesn't mean they're trying to turn people vegan. It means they're trying to create some noise. So it, does, it means, like, what effective at what? Creating noise or turning people vegan? I mean, so some people are fur activists. They're not trying to turn anyone vegan. They're trying to shame people in, uh, away from wearing fur. Um, everyone has different strategies and techniques. And if their intention is, you know, for the animals, as long as they're not, you know, I, I don't believe in causing violence to other people, like um, unless it's really in self-defense. But, you know, I don't believe in actually being violent to someone uh, to create um, the change that we want. I just, I just don't know about harming anyone. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, looking extreme or being extremists, um, that's all a matter of perception. Uh, detracting from the movement. I really don't like those who are out there, um, spending all their time, resources and energy and creative ability slating other animal rights activists. I think that that's just, well, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? Why don't you use all of that energy into speaking up for the animals instead of slating, criticizing, making articles about other activists? I mean, get yourself some perspective and use your energy to speak up for animals who are screaming in gas chambers. So yeah, I think that that's like a little bit of a detracting thing, but that's not animal rights activism. That's just, I don't know, some type of weird jealous hatred or some type of, I don't really know what fuels people like that. Um, if they use their energy for the animals, they'd be very, very productive activists. Um, so they are think that that is problematic in a way. Um, although there are legitimate criticisms, some people, they're just, you know, it's just 
clear there's some ulterior motive to it. I, I don't like uh, giving people an excuse to eat animal products. I don't say, oh, if you buy free range and all this, I don't think that that's animal rights activism either. Um, so telling people that there's a humane way to eat animals or c consume animal products, I think we need to be very fixed in our conviction when it comes to what's ethical and what's not. Um, you know, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. We all know that phrase. So yeah, yeah, th those things are, you know, saying there's a higher welfare way of exploiting animals. I don't agree with that. Um, spending your time um, bringing down other activists when you could be spending your time speaking up for animals. Uh, those two things. Jamie Chambers. What brand of dog food do you feed your doggo? Jamie, I do not have a dog in my care at the moment, but when I did have a dog in my care, um, I would feed them like a mixture of, I think it was vegan pet. I think it was vegan pet. Um, there's a bunch though, just, it doesn't really matter, but like I was using like a dry food, like a formulated uh, veterinary approved dry dog food and I'd mix it with a wet food that I'd just prepare myself. So I'd like overcook brown rice to the point where it was stodgy because dogs to eat so that the dog that was in my care could uh, digest it properly. And then I'd use like TVP and then some peanut butter or some lentils, really overcooked. So it was really stodgy and I'd mix it together. So yeah, like some fat, um, some whole grains, some beans, uh, not beans, some lentils they were, they were red lentils. And, um, you know, some some dry formulated vegan pet food. That's what I was doing. And then you could put in some veggies, some carrots. and But there's great recipes online if you wanted to make your own. Uh, Al in Japan said, what's planned for 2020? How long are you going to stay in the UK and where to next? How are you spending Christmas and New Year? Ooh, ooh, ooh. What's planned for 2020? Now, um, like I said, uh, my I, I'm actually by myself now. I don't have a team with me, but I've got a new management who will be helping me uh, plan out 2020. So I've ne never been one for planning, but 2020 is going to be the year for planning. In uh, terms of what is planned, we have to wait and see for that because we're going to get, to, I'm going to do everything from the ground up and um, replan, reschedule, and there could be some really big things happening for 2020, but we'll have to wait to see. How long are you going to stay in the UK and where to next? Ooh, we don't, I don't actually know yet. I don't actually know yet. Um, sorry, Al, but you'll be the first to know. <laughs> How are you spending Christmas and New Year's? I'm actually out in the country at the moment. I'm out of the office. So I'll be spending Christmas and New Year's out here with some friends. Um, speaking of which, have a happy one. Oh, thank you very much, Al in Japan. Okay. So, Al, I'm sorry I can't tell you more, but I'm in a planning phase right now. Um, Robbie. Robbie Ethart? Eth Ethart. How did family and friends react when you started doing activism and how did it affect your relationship with them? Thank you for all you do, Joey. Okay, if my family and friends react. Um, I really don't know how my friends reacted because I wasn't in contact with a lot of them. They were, a lot of my friends were uh, either gang members or they were in prison or they uh, you know, had a, they, they lived a certain life, so I wasn't really in contact with them. The friends that I wasn't were in contact with, they couldn't really believe it. There was a lot of ridicule that happened. You know, a lot of people just, you know, my friend group, we used to give each other a bit of shit, you know. We were, we were poking fun at each other all the time for our whole lives, so of course they're going to poke fun at me for this, but I think they were just happy, my friends especially and my family were just happy that I was sober and not out there causing havoc when I, like, when I was a drug addict and a gang member. I was very violent and very hard to be around. Um, very unstable. So yeah, they were happy that I was sober and stable. The the animal rights thing, I guess they there was a lot of respect for that, but also a bit of ridicule for the vegan thing. And you know that they're really steak eating, meat eating. Uh, you know, people. A lot of my friends, my family. Um, they were a bit off it at the start, but as the years went by and how serious they they realised this was, a lot of my family are actually vegan now. So my mum, my brother, their my brother's wife, their child, uh, my my oldest brother, he's like vegan but vegetarian like he eats predominantly plant plant based i'm going to say that um then i've got like cousins and uncles and stuff who have taken on the a plant based diet as well so yeah friends and family everyone's going to react a little bit shocked at the start there's going to be some pushback but the longer you're vegan the more people start to take it seriously and obviously i'm all over the internet and you know viral videos and then on the news and on i was all over the media so then they started to, wow, what's going on here? People are taking Joey seriously and 
Maybe we should too. Sue Bamford. Hi, Joey. Just wondering if you see yourself moving back to Australia in the near future. Um, not in the near future, but possibly in the future. Okay, we've got Mandy Mankowska. Joey Loveheart, I think you've done this before, but would you be keen to do more activism with baby animals such as piglets? I think the impact would be double. The people would instantly make the connection between their vegan hearts and lifelong omni-conditioning. It would unravel their cognitive dissonance and put things into perspective uh, visually rather than purely relying on factual arguments that may not uh, make that much sense to their conditioned minds. Love you. Okay, yeah, th thanks, Mandy. I really appreciate your support and your question. Um, I get what you're saying. It's more of an emotional reaction when they actually see the piglet. I did a, uh, a video uh, about a year or two ago called Piglets vs. the Public. Uh, that was with Julian the piglet, and there was another piglet. I forgot the other piglet's name. I'm so sorry. Um, but Julian, if you ever see me kissing this little baby piglet, that's Julian, little baby piglet. They were rescued from a factory farm and there was an opportunity to do that. Uh, that opportunity does not come along um, very often. Uh, to be honest, um, that those piglets had been down that beachfront uh, many times before. Um, the person who was, they, they were in their care had taken them out to that beach and loved, they loved going around, running around on the beach. So I, could, I had an opportunity to, to talk to the passers-by about the piglets, um, but that, it's not really that, um, it's quite difficult to take a piglet that's been rescued from a horrible situation and bring them out into the public, um, you know, th those opportunities are really rare to come by, and, you know, putting a piglet through that type of stress is not really that, even though the, the knock-on effect of people seeing that piglet is really positive for the species of that animal uh you know like this, that video i know is responsible for turning a lot of people vegan it went viral on facebook like a million people seen it on facebook hundreds of thousand people have seen it on youtube it had a really big impact um it's just those opportunities are really hard to come by you know, i can't just manufacture opportunities like that but you know i really am considering doing something um with the help of maybe a sanctuary in the future patrick says isn't not murdering animals great? Well, Patrick, yes, it is. It's fantastic. I wouldn't say it's great. I just, I would just think it's like, well, it is. It's, it's, it's amazing. But like, it should just be the status quo. It should just be like the general moral baseline not to stab animals and not to eat their dead bodies or pay for them to be stabbed. I mean, you know, not abusing human children is great too. <laughs> but it should just be something that's expected of society, uh, you know, it shouldn't be like, it doesn't make you a good person not to contribute to the murder of animals, it just makes you morally neutral. But thanks, Patrick, I'm glad that you're a vegan. Uh, David says, David Naylor, what do you think of the argument that animal agriculture on, on at least some scale is essential to keep your ecosystems healthy? Uh, such as our soils, and that growing enough to feed the world through monoculture would cause damage as our ecosystems are perhaps not designed to sustain this type of system. I'm thinking of Joe Rogan's recent videos. Could technologies be the answer? Uh, David, <clears throat> I haven't seen um, the, the argument on Joe Rogan's videos. I haven't seen what they're actual, actually saying. Um, animal agriculture on at least some style, scale is essential to keep our ecosystems healthy, such as our soils. Um, the, the thing is, Animal agriculture, the, the, the leading cause of deforestation is animal agriculture. I know that deforestation is really bad for the soils. Uh, everything dries up. And look, I'm not a specialist on soil, but I know deforestation is really bad. Um, and the reason we're monocropping so much is to feed animals. <laughs> you know, so, well, more planting of trees would take the carbon out of the air and help replenish uh, the soil. But in terms of like, exploiting animals to murder them why why i mean like there's a difference between having animals roaming freely and and you know m leaving their droppings on the soil you don't have to breed them and murder them in the process why murder them you know why murder them i think it's just people looking for an this is people clutching at straws looking for an excuse to murder animals i mean i'm not saying animals aren't essential to keep our ecosystems healthy but what I'm saying is, like, why do we have to murder them to keep our e ecosystems healthy? That's just people that love meat trying to find an excuse. Um, I'm very suspicious of that. Um, and I think that needs a lot more thinking through by experts. But the, in no way do we need to breed and murder animals to keep the ecosystems healthy. Way before animal agriculture, the ecosystems were fine, okay? 
Now we have animal agriculture. Guess what's happening? The the the, the earth is going to sh- absolute shit, it's going to hell in a handbasket because of the the resources. Um, you know, water use, land use, um, deforestation, all of the uh, the the carbon footprint of animal agriculture, uh, the greenhouse gases, all of those things. Animal agriculture, in no way, is fundamental to a healthy ecosystem. It's completely the opposite. Um, so yeah, that's my perspective on that one, David. Uh, we need more experts on soil erosion, and you know, I think that these people they have a bi- they have a bias, and they have a they, they, they just have this um, ulterior motive. They want to find an excuse, a really good excuse for eating meat. Uh, Nicholas Valentin says, As animal rights activists who are working to bring an end to the systematic oppression of non-human animals, what would you say are our are, are greatest strengths and weaknesses as a community? Our greatest strengths is our um, sort of uh, our willingness to go up against adversity uh, because we we understand what we're doing is uh, right, the right thing. So we can go up against all adversity and our tenacity um, and the, the way that we um, are working together in various different ways. Our weaknesses as a community would be um, the way that people spend too much time bringing other people down who are trying to do the right thing um, and the infighting and, you know, all of those uh, things that, that take our... our um, take the energy from hardworking activists and, and sort of distract people from the what's going on to animals. I think these are all weaknesses as a community. Um, but the, the greatest strengths uh, is our character, strength of character in the face of adversity, um, our willingness to keep going and to keep the animals close to our heart. Uh, Yvonne, hello. Uh, hi, Joey. Hi, 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 Yvonne. I can't pronounce your, your last name, but we've had multiple Skype sessions together. My um, question would be, what was your big aha moment? Your uh, my big aha moment. Um, I guess she means um, my aha moment when I went vegan. My aha moment um, mainly. While I was on house arrest, I put on a lot of weight and I was looking for a diet to lose weight and I came across a raw foodist who was talking about the power of plants. I used his juice fasting technique to lose a lot of weight and I felt amazing. So that was kind of like a big seed planted there. While I was in prison, I stopped using drugs and alcohol for the first time in 12 years and I seen things from this new perspective, a bird's eye view of my life. So I had kind of an epiphany in prison. That was a huge aha moment. And then when um, I was got out and I wasn't fully vegan yet and I was criticizing my mum about smoking and she talked about the vices people have that they don't change. I used that time when she said those words, I reflected and instantly thought I've always wanted to be uh, a vegan. I've always known exploiting animals is completely wrong and unjustified, but I've got a piece of a cow or chicken on my plate and I stopped being complacent and I took the plunge right there and then. Those were my aha moments. Um, My highlight of 2019, that's coming. I'll let you guys know about all that. The biggest challenge for 2019 would be my trauma therapy. I was in trauma therapy for the last year. Um, it was a big challenge for me to face all those deep, dark demons. And But I um, feel like the, the treatment was really effective with me and, I, and it was a huge challenge. But uh, also the, the highlight of 2019 was also a big challenge for me too. But the biggest challenge was uh, dealing with my trauma, which I'm very grateful that I had the help of a beautiful therapist to do that. I know it's more than one question. Last one. What are your goals for 2020 besides making everyone go vegan? Um, I'm going to set out goals for 2020. I'm also going to set out a plan. And I'm thinking about maybe running those past you guys. Um, I really think goals and plans should be kept between the person who's making them and I think you're more likely to achieve them. Um, But I'm always striving to do more. So that's what I'll say. Um, In terms of loose plans, I'll be making those loose plans within the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to rebuild everything from the ground up and start fresh. So oh, she says, I'd love to see you on a TED talk. You never know. You never know. Thank you again for doing what you do for the animals. You're an amazing activist and person. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Yvonne, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, Yeah, but in terms of um, the biggest highlight, I'll be releasing that very soon. And my goals, I'm going to keep them between me and, you know, I think the goals thing 
you just know that it's to to reach more people and to turn convert more people to veganism to make more activists. So how I do that um, will be very systematic, and I plan this year. This year will be the one of the only years of me being an activist where I've actually made plans. So yeah. Okay, so we've got the last question here, I believe. Or one of the last questions. We'll have a look. Joey, any plans for a North American tour? Would love to meet you here in Vancouver, Canada. Keep up the fight. Uh, your work inspires me to get active. Go into my third cube tomorrow. Boom, your videos are changing lives. Thanks so much, jo uh, Tosh. Thanks for your support. Uh, could possibly be in Vancouver, Canada. I can't go to North America for um, because it's just customs reasons. It's a bit difficult. But Canada could definitely be on the cards. Thank you so much, Tosh. Okay. So that looks like that's all of the questions from my amazing Patreon supporters. Thank you so much, guys. Um, in terms of my answers to the questions, like I said, I don't claim to know everything. Um, a lot of these things are up for discussion, especially the gray areas with, um, you know, fruits and vegetables being uh, fertilized with the manure and a couple of other gray areas that we talked about too. But always open for discussion and learning more. And I hope you guys are all focused on achieving your goals for 2020 or at least making out a loose plan and, you know, staying strong and uh, just brainstorming on how we can, uh, how you can make a difference and, you know, step things up a notch. I'm always trying to step things up a notch year after year. And I just want to thank everyone who supported me so far and who's been there for me. And, you know, it's been a big year. It's been quite exhausting at times, lots of highs and lows, but it's been all completely worth it, and we can never rem we can never forget uh, why we're all uh, fighting and why we're vegan and why we're we're activists. And if you're not yet vegan and you're listening to this all the way through, wow, Merry Christmas! Thanks for coming this far, and I hope your New Year's resolution is to stop eating the abused body parts of animals who were tortured and killed in slaughterhouses, and to help um, band together with us all to to make this world a better place. So thank you all to my, especially to my amazing Patreons and donors and supporters and commenters and everyone who's subscribed. And we made a hundred K subscribers this year. It was amazing. And I just want to send love out to you and to anyone who's doing it hard because it's a Christmas season and they have to be around family and friends around the table where there's a, an abused animal on the table. And I just want you to stay strong and, um, you know, to, to remain calm and, you know, maybe don't be combative at this, at this time of the season, but maybe to be, to, to try to, to affect people positively and try to get them thinking and try to get them making, um, you know, more ethical decisions, but be smart about it and ask, you know, leading questions and talk, draw the conversation towards, you know, their principles generally and, um, see if they, that they want to help bring more compassion into the world and do this all in a positive way. I mean, being combative and um, causing a big fight at the table this year. I, I mean, try not to do that. I mean, it's just going to, it's just going to make your life harder. But if there are any emotions coming up this year, I want you to use those emotions as fuel to help generate your advocacy in the future. That's what I do. I always use all these emotions, this anger, the, the negative feelings. I, I, I use them to generate my activism going forward. So thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Carb Strong Cast, the Christmas special. Uh, it's been good. I really enjoy these longer form chats. It gives me more of a time to to talk to you about all different topics, a range of different topics. And um, th the next Carb Strong Cast, we'll probably have a guest. If we don't, it will be me again, but we'll be talking about something interesting. But thank you all for tuning in. And... Stay vegan, and I'll see you all in the next video or the next podcast. Peace. Mm -hmm.